here in Chicago, we're kind of trying too hard to be cool or to try <laughs> to be San Francisco, you yeah, know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's just like, it doesn't translate very good. Yeah. And it's something that I'm very outspoken about. And I'm curious to kind of hear your thoughts because you kind of represent like who I want to be, you know, yeah. five years, six years down the line. You kind of been through with it and we'll kind of get a little bit into the story. So curious what your take is in like the Chicago tech ecosystem world, particularly now that you're making this transition from, you know, entrepreneur to investor. What is your perception of Chicago's tech scene right now? What are the opportunities? Where are the challenges? Yeah. Um, so even though I know we just talked a little bit about the kind of challenges with the city, I'm like, I think as bullish as I have been in like 10 years on Chicago tech. And I'll tell you why. And it's funny, like, um, why I say 10 years is there was a moment in time, um, in like 2013 ish where Brad Keywell and Eric Lefkowski started light bank. Um, and it was their own money. It was a hundred million dollar fund. And regardless of like the performance of that fund, and I'm not really sure what the numbers were, like how many great outcomes they had, there was money flying into Chicago companies and Chicago startups and you could feel it. And right. so like that felt really cool. And it wasn't like later stage, like de-risk money. It was early stage, pre-idea, pre-product seed money. Um, and there was a lot of risk taking because of that. And so I think we're seeing a bit of that again. There have obviously been a lot of new venture funds that have launched, obviously the one that I'm a part of starting line in the last few years. And I think you have a pandemic that has accelerated remote work because historically, unfortunately, what you've had is, you know, we've got one of, if not the best engineering school in the world here with the University of Illinois, right? And then we've got Kellogg, Northwestern, DePaul, all this stuff. But folks historically have gone to coasts to go have long right. tech careers. They've gone to New York, they've gone to SF, obviously, they've gone to LA, right. Austin. Like that is no longer necessary. Um, and, and now folks are actually moving from San Francisco back to where they were from Chicago and building companies here, which is a massive opportunity. Right. Um, so yeah, I, I do, th like I am bullish. I think we're early in like that next cycle of capital being deployed. What I personally think it's really going to take is five plus $10 billion outcomes because that's what Silicon Valley has is they have that engine where company gets started, massive exit, creates a thousand millionaires. Those guys, those guys and gals start angel investing. They start companies, exit, new thousand millionaires. And like, dude, that's like, that's what happens, right? Twitter goes public, a thousand people become millionaires. They each write 20 angel checks a year and it's this wickedly awesome flywheel. Uh -huh. And we just don't really have that yet. Like we're still talking about Groupon here. Right. That's, yeah. that, and I, there's something that I model myself after so much, like the PayPal mafia, but for Latinos, yeah. like that's the shit that keeps me up at night. And I'm like, if I can, if I can make a dent in the universe, it has to be that way. Because if I can create a thousand Latino millionaires yeah. that do that and the yeah. flywheel creates becomes really impactful. And you know, you've seen the investor wall that we have in the, in the office. Now we have the investor candles and we have the team candles and the vision is like, they need to become the next LPs. They need to become the next, the next investors. Yeah. Cause that's really the only way that we're going to normalize the system. Yeah. So I think it's a, a um, it, I definitely, you know, I agree. It's a, it's a, it's a very important time. It's a very interesting time to be building in the Midwest. Yeah. Uh, I think situationally, uh, you know, there's so much that is happening. Uh, it, but I was also, you know, speaking with the, with the campaign people with Lori that it almost seems like the default is, oh, I finally made it or I finally broke through. Now I need to leave and go to the coast. <laughs> so I was like to almost to be like, oh, now I can be legit. I need to get the fuck out. Yeah. So there's still that. And I'm trying to kind of dig deeper and trying to figure out what's like the reason behind it. It, it, it perhaps is that a lot of people may not feel like they can have access to what's happening here because maybe it's reserved for a very tiny amount of the population. It's something that I constantly think about from my perspective. Curious to see if you have any thoughts on that. Yeah. Um, I mean, I think like I, I see that more historically as people sort of leaving to where there is opportunity, where the capital is, like San Francisco and New York. And I, I do see that starting to change here. And I think when there start to be a parade of exits in Chicago, yeah. whenever it comes with Cash Drop and Project 44 and Cameo and a slew of other Foxtrot and a slew of other companies that have multi-billion dollar exits, like the energy, the capital, the expertise and the freedom that's gonna pour into the city, because all of a sudden you're gonna have hundreds and thousands of people that have the ability to like decide what they wanna do next. And I think right. a very 
very large portion of them are going to decide to build here and decide to invest here, right? Um, and so, yeah, what we need is like, you know, another hundred Mike Gamsons, like go, running around writing hundred thousand dollar checks. Shout yeah. out Mike Gamson. Yeah. So you think it's just a matter of time before that happens or, you know, is there some other important triggers that we need to kind of create before we can have those five to 10 X, uh, X's that are that meaningful? No, man, I think like the, the DNA is there and like the, there's a lot of companies at that stage. I mean, going back to the, um, going back to earlier the discussion about the city, we just can't kill the golden, golden goose. Like we have to make sure that people want to stay and live here and feel right. safe here. Right. And like, I'm like, you, I'm not close to the Ken Griffin situation, right? But that's a huge reason why he moved thousands of the smartest people in Illinois out of the state. And yeah. so um, we, we do have to protect that. But otherwise, that that being held constant, um, no, I think we're in a really special place with company trajectory that we're going to start to see that flywheel um, begin here and, and people stay and then build again and build again. And there have already been like a couple examples of that with, you know, the Rocket Miles founder selling, starting another business here. And there's a lot of people on their second, third, fourth go, fourth go around here, which is awesome. Yeah, I think so. I think the environment is prime. Um, and I think it also highlights, I think, what makes Midwest uh, entrepreneurship special, like just the bootstrap mentality, just like the grind mode. Yeah. You know, it's like we've been overlooked for so, so long that we're just used to just putting our head down and grinding. Yeah. But I think that's right now the best conditions to create really meaningful businesses. Totally. Because you just, you're going to keep fucking going. You're going to persevere, right? Dude. Like winter's here, but you're not going to die. You're going to survive. Yeah, for sure. No. So I think that ethos and that build mentality that I think Chicago is famous for and work ethic is is going to serve us well because, you know, there, there are a lot of people that probably join startups that, you know, are, are going to leave during this um, kind of next phase of stuff because the really, really hard put your head down work is going to start. Um, right. And I think, like you said, there's always been a hard work, work ethic in, in Chicago. So obviously, you know, when I met you and kind of heard some of your story, I was really fascinated. I think, I think you're one of the craziest, most successful operating minds that I know yeah. of. And I look up to you. Uh, uh, so I, I would love to kind of hear it a little bit of your background. Yeah. How did you get started? What are some of the key learnings that were really impactful down in your career? Yeah, man. Well, appreciate that. Um, so started my career in finance, but just because I wanted like, I think that's just a good like foundational training of to, to, that's like relevant across businesses. But I always wanted to build stuff. Um, and so I tried to build a couple of startups on my own um, and won like a startup competition, got something like remotely off the ground in like the enterprise wellness space. Um, but um, when nothing was really, you know, like clicking in a big way, I was like, all right, I want to grow something that I think is going to grow I want to I want to join something that I think is going to grow extremely quickly. That was like literally my criteria, mm. and so I spent a long time figuring out what those two things were, were like what that looked like. And I identified Uber and Instacart. This was 2013, like in June, um, and went down the road with both of them um, for like a month. Ultimately, took the Instacart job as like the tenth employee and came on to you know, launched their first market outside of the Midwest or outside of San Francisco and then ultimately spent six years there. Um, and here's like how, I mean, here's how intentional I was about that journey. I don't think, <laughs> I don't think I've ever told you the story, but um, I want, I did a bunch of diligence on Instacart and I was like, holy cow, like I, I believe, like I said, I believe this is going to grow super, super quick. So I, like I had a, I had a blog where I was writing about like startups and tech and stuff. I bought targeted Facebook ads at the founders. Um, so they'd <laughs> log on, they'd see my face, they'd click through to my blog, would like tweet out a nonstop. And so finally Mike Max Mullen, like the co-founder was like, dude, like what the heck? Like great follow up. Like I'll talk to you. Um, and so, uh, he and I joke about that still to this day. And so, yeah, came on board, spent six years there. I mean, it was transformative. Um, you know, went from nothing to, you know, I think it's like going to do 30 plus billion in gross sales this year, um, which is awesome. <laughs> um, and so that was an incredible journey. And I, so my closest friends are there and I'm sure you feel the same way about here. Cause like startups and like, <laughs> in a way, like it's like trauma and like <laughs> relationships are forged in trauma because like the, the highs and lows are so brutal and yeah. it's so all encompassing. It's like just a part of your life. So yeah, those are some of my best relationships. And so that's where I started my career. Um, and then I spent a couple years running the central region at Flexport, a San Francisco based logistics company. Um, there I are a, investors, by the way. Shout out Flexport. Oh yeah, that's right. Ben <laughs> Braverman. Um, and uh, so I was running the 200 person team um, in the central region, which was really awesome. And then spent the last two years as an executive at Foxtrot, a Chicago based startup and led us through our series C where we raised a hundred million bucks, um, which was awesome. I, I love that business. And Mike, the founder is such an incredible entrepreneur. You want to talk about a Chicago 
hustler that had to run that business on six months of cash forever and got told no from every VC and kept his head down and was like, I believe, I believe, I believe, and built what I think is going to be the next Starbucks slash 7-Eleven that's going to be here in a very big way. Um, so just, anyway, I'm so proud of him. Um, and now, um, you know, uh, I joined who I think is the, the best investor that I've ever known, um, Ezra Galston and uh, Haley. Um, Zolo, uh, and we're uh, a three-person partnership with a venture partner named Ade um, at Starting Line. So we're a consumer fund, investing consumer businesses based here in Chicago. Um, about 25% of our investments are here, um, and we want to really, um, yeah, we want to really build a long brand uh, in venture that kind of outlasts all of us um, for years to come. We're on our second fund, and uh, yeah, it's going well. Yeah, it's super important. Hey, I love what you said. The relationships are forged in drama. Cause yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I guess, you know, the last few months, I think, you know, the cash up family will kind of say a little bit. Some of the, there have been these days where, like, it's just stressful as fuck. Thankfully for shit, there's not, like, existential, but it's just, like, situational. Totally, like, yeah. trying to figure out team dynamics as a young startup has been, to me, I think, the, the biggest challenge, right? Like, just yeah. trying to figure out the flow, <clears throat> enable everybody to feel like they can make the mistakes and try it out and feel like they can you know, uh, 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 push back and innovate. It's, it, it, it's, a, it's a, always a work in progress and it kind of creates a lot of like pressure, I think. Yeah. And ultimately, you know, what I've learned the hard way is uh, um, not everybody's built for that. I feel yeah. like there's a lot of people that are willing to jump to the uh, occasion and, and say, I, I believe in this vision. I want to work, be yeah. a part of it. But <laughs> ultimately I think that the pressure takes a really big toll, you know? So let, let's, let's talk into that a little bit, you know, because obviously... I think everybody that's kind of either going through the journey has kind of gone through the journey fundamentally has learned some key attributes or core values required to be able to actually power to the adversity and there's the uncertainty every single day of your life until an outcome happens. Right. So I'm curious to see what are some of those fundamental core values to you that you think somebody, you know, needs to have to be able to endure. Yeah. Um, well, like the, you know, the struggles that you mentioned, you're like going through a cash drop, like so normal for um, any startup. And I think, you know, you don't realize this until I think you, you're a part of building companies about like how important culture is. And I think if you're outside of it, you're like, oh, it's like culture. It's like, no, like culture is everything. Culture is like how people work, like how hard they work, like how they work together, how they make decisions. And so like, that is like, at the end of the day, a company is just its people and the decisions that they make, like, like the product can be great, but like you, you have to have amazing um, people. And so I think like what I have found, like a lot of how to solve for that is to do everything you can to identify it in the hiring process. And so what that means is you actually have to know what your culture is and that's really hard to do. So one way to do it, and I was a part of writing our values at Instacart, one way to do it is look at the person that you admire most in the company. And I know exactly who that is at Instacart. It is the best person I've ever worked with, ever will work with. And you write down the attributes about that person. And you're like, why is that person awesome? Why is that the best single person that I have ever worked with? And it's like, he rolls his hands up, he rolls his sleeves up, like, and, he, and he like does the actual work, even though like he doesn't have to, because like he's an executive, he doesn't take himself too seriously. Like he is like a ruthless student of the business and knows every single lever. And so it was like that informs then the people that we want to have there. And then like you screen super hardcore for that in hiring. And so um, I think, you know, another, you know, one of my um, mentors, he's a, uh, Ex CFO of uh, of Instacart, he's now a um, partner at Sequoia. Ravi Gupta, he's mm -hmm. got this great management framework, which is you need to be demanding and supportive because you want a culture where you know everyone's going to be held accountable, and so that means you got to be demanding, and, and people have to know that like only like um, you know like excellence is what we strive for here, but like we're going to support you like along the way, and so like being able to strike that balance of like supporting people through problems, but being really demanding and pushing people to their limits, and so I think that's a lot of screening up front, that's a lot of telling people what you stand for, letting people opt out of that process mm -hmm. and saying like, this is what we do here. And then making sure you enforce it like day to day and making sure that the people here like all want to work like that and be like that. And then revisit your, your values, which is really just how you want to work and build your company every six to 12 months. I always heed the advice of my investor, Eric Paley. He's very smart. He's man. a very smart man, but he's also very like, he always told me Ruben venture capital is a drug. 
you have to be careful. Totally. So I was like, that doctor is like, don't take too many of these pills. You'll, you know, he's giving them to you, but he tells you to be careful. So he's, he's always kind of been like that to me. And I think it's interesting. But I, th those were, I think, pieces of advice very early on that I got that really resonated with me. Yeah. Because I, I knew about myself, like, what, what do you want, right? Like, obviously, I want the gigantic outcome. I know that we can have, you know, a really huge outcome. I just don't ever want to get to this treadmill speed that, like, makes us fall flat on our face. Uh, and then maybe, you know, like, it could be it could be a mistake or it be a stroke of genius. But to some degree, I do feel like I have the, the, the weight of my community in my shoulders. Because there's so very few people that look like me that have an opportunity like mm -hmm. the one I have. Right. That I, I am very intentional about it. So I'm like... You know, and, and I feel like it's interesting for you because you've met, you know, a lot of people at, you know, at the highest stages of the game. And the ones that I've had the opportunity to to um, to talk to that kind of have made it through, a lot of times the, the, the resonating advice to, to them, if they could do it again, is, you know, slow and steady wins the race. So I think, like, you're kind of always on this, like, rush timeline to, to move, to grow, to prove, to prove the world wrong, to kind of keep moving and progressing. Um, but I have heard this from a lot of successful founders that are currently either building or have exited that sometimes the speed can get the better of you yeah. for the worst and you know yeah, there's a lot of stories of founders getting ousted or perhaps feeling that they oversold too much and they didn't have a lot of say towards the later stages of what happened to the business and you know I, will, I can't name the founder but I, I had a piece of advice from that like that, I asked the founders, like, what if you could do it all over again? Like, where do you feel like you got fucked? And he's like, I took too much money too fast and I lost control of my dream. And that shit, it just, it really just got ingrained in my, yeah. in my brain. I'm like, real life, if I don't learn from these guys, they're telling me they're literally me in four years. Like, I, I have to listen to that. Yeah. So I've been, I, you know, I think the realization of the reality of time and the speed and the progression of shit sometimes, I'm the least patient person I've ever, I've ever known, but like that shit just kind of forces you to this new normal where it's sometimes you just have to accept like, let's take it at the right speed. It's not about who does it first, it's about who does it right. Yeah. That's why I think where the big outcomes can, you know, of the next generation can really be not only huge, but also very meaningful Yeah. and kind of create this new iteration of the tech industry. Yeah, that's really interesting. So I, I totally agree on the long-term thing, man. Like I think balancing being patient with being like hyper intense is like such an important thing to strike in startups. Dude, like Figma today, right? Sold for $20 billion. But dude, like obviously a, a once in a generation outcome, but that's 10 years, 10 years, right? Like, I mean, that's like a long freaking time. And that's like obviously an unbelievable outcome, but like they have been heads down grinding for 10 years. And so I think like one way to think about it is to be a long-term optimist, but like a short-term pessimist. And so like mm. you got like a five-year, 10-year plan, but man, like you got to hit every week, you got to hit every quarter, but you know, like over time, like it's going to ebb and flow and like you've got a long runway and like, and, and you're going to make it work. So like you got to, like balancing those two things is like super important, like giving yourself the ability to think really long-term, but knowing that like, this is like, as competitive of a game as it gets. And so like, you got to execute every month. You think that the founder culture, like the, 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 the tech culture, culture as a whole right like do you think exit cases like figma would be as rare if all founders or even the capital and the founders had that long-term thinking from the get-go because i feel like we do live in this world where like if you don't reach the 100 million dollar arr in a year by basically burning infinite amounts of capital till you hit there then you're not going to do anything so i feel like there's this there's there's I love what you said about being like long-term optimist, short-term pessimist. Yeah. Um, but I do think that we kind of have this cultural thing that's like unrealistically fast in some cases. Yeah. That I think that that's just like the, the it almost feels like a lot of the shit that I see around in tech Twitter lately is just pump and dump. Pump and dump. Pump and dump is like the thing that echoes yeah. through my head all the time, yeah. which is not at all how Figma built their business. I mean, yeah. this, these, these guys grinded it out for yeah. so fucking long. So what do you think about that? Yeah, I mean, the crazy thing about Figma, right? Like, I mean, they raised $330 million and sold for $20 billion. That's insane. I think Lyft insane. raised $7 billion and is worth five. five. Like, so, like, dude, I mean, it's crazy. Like, right? Like, I think, like, that is an unbelievable, like, compounding of value. So, yeah, like, I think what you're, like, about the 
hey, you got to do this super fast. I think part of that has just been the last 10 years has been like the craziest bull market ever because there was so much liquidity in the system that there was just always a guy upstream willing to pump in the next round at, you know, a hundred times, literally a hundred times ARR. But like those days are gone and like they're never coming back. Like they're just like, that's not the new normal. Like this is the new normal. And so, um, yeah, I think you'll probably see a little bit more like milestone based funding and long term thinking and, and less of the, you know, hundred million dollar rounds a year into businesses. Yeah, I, th I think we were talking about this uh, last time we caught yeah. up. You talk about how Silicon Valley created this like perfect system of milestone based fundraising. Yeah. yeah. Do you want to talk about that a little bit? Well, I just think it's an awesome machine, right? Like it's just it's such a cool way that like venture capital like works and was started in the Valley is like we will give you money in, you know, friends and family or seed money to prove a concept. It's like, all right, cool. You got to like go 12 months to do that. Oh my gosh, great. Like you got customers and you've got a couple hundred thousand dollars. Awesome. Like we're going to put together a series A round of funding. It's like, and here's what like we expect there. And it's like, okay, next milestone is series B. And like for, here are like the generally accepted principles of like what a series B round is. And it's like, Ooh, sorry, like not there yet. Like either going to wind it down or take a down round. And it's just like, it's a very transparent way of, um, of kind of like building a business and how to get the capital required. And I think that was just perverted over the last 10 years, people aping into deals at like 100x ARR. Yeah. 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 I, I definitely saw a little bit of that. Uh, <laughs> you turned down a lot of money, though. Proud, like, I yeah. turned down a lot of money. And I tell, you know, I tell people I we've raised 16 ish, uh, turned down more than 80. So that's um, it's hard. It was it was it was a, it was um, but I, like you said, talking about what you want, like, yeah. you know, uh, what do I want? I, I want to build the largest possible business where the control is optimized for the community and the people that I want to champion. Yeah. It's not all for me. It's for a very particular set of, you know, communities that I believe have been long, you know, devoid of all these opportunities. And I need to think about that when I'm building this business because at the end of the day, we're trying to really focus on them anyway, right? And they represent a really large piece of the buying power in this country. So it's, it's almost like a little bit of for them, by them. And it, so that's where I'm like, take a step back, take a breath. It might take a little bit longer. It might be a little bit harder. But like, this is the course that you have to take for this business. So I inherently believe that. And it's kind of let us, you know, I, I honestly could not be happier with the outcome that we have so far. It almost seems like that the, the biggest aspiration that we have is to be a great small business owner. But why not a billionaire? Why not a gigantic company? Why not these like huge fucking exit cases? And I think role models is a really big piece of that. So to kind of bounce it back to you, like, who were some of these like direct or indirect <clears throat> mentors very early for you? Generally, the people that I look up to um, and that I work really hard to emulate um, are people that are like happy and that people that have a zest for life. That's like sadly really rare. And I mean like people that are genuinely happy, wake up every day excited to be themselves, say things that are positive, that are kind, leave people like more excited like than, than when um, you know you started talking to them. Um, and so I think that there's like a lot, like there's a lot of things that go into that. And I think a lot of it comes with being like, for the most part, like a, a really balanced person and like a three, which is really hard, but like to the best of your ability, having like a three-legged stool, um, you know? And so like, there's a ton of super successful and rich people that are miserable. And like that just like, mm. I, I'm dead serious when I say like, I have like zero envy of any of that. Like the people, like I've got a good buddy in, in Chicago, uh, Joe Shenton who is the sing just the happiest dude ever. And he happens to be really successful, but he has an unbelievable family. Um, and he just wakes up every day with his five kids packed in his Suburban and attacks <laughs> freaking life. You know, so I know you're a relatively new dad. Yeah. Uh, and I know family seems to be a very important uh, value for you. Now that you're kind of, you're going through this transition, right? Yeah. Into this investing or the, the, the empowerment side, I told you before, yeah. of the equation. And that's a very sacred position to hold, I believe. Uh, it's one that I always, I'm very taunty when it comes to VC sometimes. And I'm very outspoken. I know with you it. have a, a love, hate, hate, hate But I, I do think that it's the individuals driving the capital that's more about the, the, the yeah. idea of it. And yeah, I think I you're definitely one of the good ones. Thanks. Um, but, you know, my question to you is like, what's the biggest 
meaning or impact do you want to create as an investor now, particularly when it pertains to the future that can be created for your kids? Yeah, I think like the first thing is like the Hippocratic Oath, like do no harm. Like in, in most cases, like, you know, their investors like just shouldn't get in the way. Um, uh, and so like, I think that's like really important. It's like, let, let the, you know, founders do their thing. Um, and so, but I think like gen generally, like with the boards that I sit on and the companies like I work with is like, you know, just like your COO or your right hand, you know, woman at the company, like you just want that person to be like invested in you and like believe that you guys are going the right places because like they're going to be really, really hard times. And so like, that's like what I try to bring is just like balance and cool and be like, Oh dude, like you think that's a problem? Like I, like we were burning $30 million a month <laughs> and like, it was like, it was insane. Like I can tell you all these stories. Like, like, yes, it's a problem. Like let's fix it. But, like don't sweat it. And like, let me talk to you through like one of the ways to solve it. And you probably have like five better ways. So I think like being even keeled when, and um, founders are going through really hard problems and not being an amplifier of, of bad issues, um, I think is really important. But I think like in, in the actual like uh, investment process, when you're talking to founders, just like be respectful and realize that like this is someone who has probably left everything that they've, you know, in their prior like career or lives to go like try to bend the world and bring something new into, into society. And so like, just be like in awe of that and, and, and whether you invest or not, which, you know, 98% of the time you're not going to invest, but just like be a champion of that person. Um, mm -hmm. and not just like the fake, you know, how can I be helpful, but just like leave that person feeling better. Um, which is, sounds like a very low bar, but I think is an important <laughs> thing. Yeah. Yeah. And how do you, um, I love that. That's, that's, it's simple, but it's true. I think it's important to, to, to do. And, and obviously I think like, um, I think one of the biggest opportunities in the tech space for Chicago is definitely the way that, uh, the capital flows and how it gets directed. Yeah. Um, and I saw this, my, my, in, in, you know, in my story where, um, you know, a very tiny fraction of the amount of capital we raise is not from Chicago. Right. And it's not because I didn't try. Yeah, of course. But I know that there are people like Estra, like you, that are kind of like thinking about it differently. What's the biggest thing that you can do to change the funding culture of Chicago? Yeah. Um, well, I think there have been a good, um, you know, like mini proliferate, prol proliferation of like venture funds in and around the city, which I think is really important. I do think we need to continue develop to develop like a super angel network here because mm -hmm. like that's often the capital that is most um, missing is like the first dollars in to allow someone to leave a job and do something. So like, like pre product or like right when a product is there, like that is when a lot of money is needed. And so I do think it goes back to what I said earlier, where like we need these companies that are on good trajectories to have their big outcomes. And yeah. then to make sure that we welcome those employees and those founders with open arms, back into this city, celebrate their success, and do what we can to have them pour a lot of that capital back into the city um, to be able to build the next companies and compound wealth for other people and themselves and the city. And so um, I, I do fundamentally believe that that's like the, the next big thing that will help kickstart the flywheel here for company formation. Just right. Like, yeah. And I, and I think everybody that's building will tell you that. Everybody that sold a yeah. billion dollar business will tell you that. But I think somebody that hasn't started will stop themselves from starting because they don't know that one fundamental truth of things. Like nobody fucking knows what the fuck they're doing yeah. half the time. They're just doing it. Right. They're Dude, just my, building it. My, one of my favorite stories, the founder of MailChimp that, God, would I get bought by into it by like a, something absurd? He never raised any money. And mm -hmm. they were like asking him like recently, like about like net revenue retention. He's like, uh, he was like, I have no idea what any of that is. He's like, I just looked at my bank account and I wanted it to go every month. It had to be higher. And like, he just built this thing. And so it's like, that's the guy who's like, he's like thinking about like investors and stuff. It's like, I'm building this awesome company and like more money has to come in that goes out. And then he sells it for maybe like a billion dollars. I forget what it was, but something crazy. So I love that story. A curious question there. Where's the balance between like the book or the framework versus like, is the framework really as one size fits all? Probably not. Yeah. You know, it's like, a, where do you find that balance as an operator, or an entrepreneur where like this shit has never really been written to a degree? Yeah. Like, where is the balance for you? Yeah, I think, you know, it's a generalization, but most of the really successful like founders that I've worked for or, or know are like voracious readers. So like our students of history, students of the game, 
Um, but there's like nothing, absolutely no like replacement for actually just going and getting started. Like if like Ryan Peterson started Flexport because he was importing like bikes from China and like mm. and stuff, like little e-bikes and scooters. And he's like, this is insane. Like this custom brokerage process, like I can probably do it better. And then he started and like, it, I mean, it's the hardest company ever to build and like <laughs> 10 years later, here it is, right? And so like, I love that example. To wind down, like what would be, you know, to your younger self, what's like the biggest piece of advice you would give your younger self now with everything you know and everybody you've met? You know, it's funny because I remember at, I would ask this to like 40 year olds that were really mm. successful all the time and it would, and they would always say, what I, and I would like, I hate that advice. And it was <laughs> like to like chill out and to like relax and just like basically what you and I said, which is like realize that anything good takes time. Like, dude, like, sure. Like Kevin Systrom starts Instagram and sells it for a billion dollars. Like that's like a year later. That's like one in a billion, like will never doesn't happen. And so just like, like you can be like maniacal and like want things to happen, but just realize that like anything good, like relationships, like businesses takes time, takes a decade plus. And so just like do the right next thing, like, and check in like with yourself every quarter, like do the right next thing and to check in, but like, just do not kill yourself with stress about wanting things to happen uh, quickly. I always like to end with a fun question. What's your favorite quote and why? So I have two things hanging in my office. Um, one is the man in the arena um, from Teddy Roosevelt, which is amazing. Um, so that's a very long thing about, it's not the critic who counts, it's the builder, it's the person actually doing it. But then the other one thing that's hanging in my office is, and it's not, it's not like a motivational quote, it's literally a quote that was said by Elon Musk at a, at a press conference. So it was, I think it was after Sp SpaceX's second or third rocket explosion and they were running out of money. Um, and he's getting just like hammered by these like reporters and he's like emotional. And they ask him, like, are you optimistic about like, this working like are like like are you optimistic that like you're gonna get a rocket to launch and i literally have this in my mouth it says optimism pessimism fuck that as god as my bloody witness i am hell-bent on making it work <laughs> and like i mean it's just like it's insane right and so and then he went and did it so i love that um a uh, big fan of that sort of like relentless attitude yeah what about yeah. you one of my favorite quotes is by uh spanish author miguel de cervantes okay it's a very famous book hero called Don Quixote. Sure. And it's this like guy that's kind of going insane and kind of seeing all these visions. And the, the quote's a little long, so I'll kind of paraphrase it. But he's saying, when life itself feels lunatic, who knows where madness lies? Hmm. Perhaps to give up dreams is madness. Perhaps to be too practical is madness. But the maddest thing of all is to see life as it is and not as it should be. And that's my favorite quote. I dig it. Seeing life as it should be is my biggest motivator. I don't ever take stuff as is. I need to be able to create the world that I want to live in. Or that I try.